This is a trip I did to Iraqi Kurdistan in the spring of 2019. I hope to share with all of you what I experienced as best as I can. In the end, I hope some of you have the pleasure of seeing this incredible place for yourself someday. As the morning bus left Duhok going east, I was already getting excited about our day's first major stop. On the way there, some very picturesque landscape was a treat to look at. We were in the very north part of Iraq, and looking north towards Turkey presented some Alps-type views that were as beautiful as they come. Next, the grade increased and we started climbing. A wall that was clearly built for security reasons started marking the journey. This water park utilizing the natural stream's flow looked like an awesome series of designs and levels. In the summer and on Fridays, it gets really busy. Saddam Hussein had many palaces, some claim up to 100. These would also function as tools to exercise his power and influence, using them to host his political colleagues and mistresses. This one was destroyed in a Kurdish uprising in 1991 and never rebuilt, so it had been a relic since that time. See there? You still have some marble there. During Saddam's reign, he would have three meals per day prepared at each one of his palaces. It was not only boastful, but it served as an important security measure, as it helped create the illusion that he might pop in at any moment. It would build his mystique, but also be an important tool to keep an anxious and paranoid environment within his underlings. This specific site sat atop such an incredible viewpoint. Traveling below Gara Mountain through the plains, another one of Saddam's palaces sits in ruins. The two view each other, and there once was a cable car built for travel between them. Long live Kurdistan's Peshmerga is now the motto displayed on the old outer wall. This area is very fertile and produces wheat, corn, tobacco, fruit, nuts, and many other products. The Mesa town of Ahmadiyya was a stronghold for the ancient Jews of this area. It sits at an elevation of 4,600 feet. The city is one of the oldest in the world, and we know it was even called Ahmadi in 2500 BC. The most famous lore surrounding Ahmadiyya is that it was the home of the Magi who traveled to see Jesus Christ immediately after his birth, also known as the Three Wise Men. This story comes from the book of Matthew, who claims that the Magi came from the East to worship the King of the Jews in the world. What an amazing experience to get to pass the afternoon in this place. This mosque was founded in 1177 and its 108-foot-tall minaret was constructed in the 15th century. Inside is a spiral staircase leading to the top. In 1961, it was damaged by airstrikes from the Iraqi government, but was rebuilt using the original stones. Some sources say that this site was actually a temple for the Roman Mithraic cult before it became a Jewish synagogue. After that, it was the Church of St. George, and then eventually a 12th-century Islamic mosque. 
This Christian architecture is still visibly present in the mosque's overall design in many of its main parts. Although today Muslims are the majority group in this town, it still functions as a place where many religions coexist here as a united community. Residents are proud that at gatherings, from weddings to funerals, the family's religion is nearly indistinguishable as everyone shares in the celebration. Most of the citadels in Kurdistan have been destroyed or incorporated into a larger city just like we saw in Erbil. However, with Ahmadiyya, the town is still thriving within its ancient constraints. For fans of history and culture, this is a very important reason to be concerned with the preservation of this historical town. In ancient times, this gate was one of two entrances to the city. And even today, it's easy to see how its perched position would make Ahmadiyya extremely difficult to siege. This whole hilly area is a popular summer vacation spot due to its cooler temperature. According to one study, about 90% of the people who come to this area never even bother to venture on top of the mound to Ahmadiyya. There are more hotels in the works nearby, and local Kurdish political leaders are trying to find ways to put the conservation of this historical site ahead of tourism. With a future uncertain, Ahmadiyya is a reason to find hope and humanity in its ability to come together. As we traveled east down the Great Zab River, the valleys got even greener. Mustafa Barzani and his older brother Ahmed are key historical figures who fought for Kurdish independence against the Iraqi government in the 1920s and 30s. Not too long ago, Mustafa's son went on to become the president of Kurdistan. In modern times, the family name is a touchy subject. As Kurdish government workers are often going unpaid, the family has isolated themselves for years with incredible wealth and mansions around the world. Journalists who have criticized the family have been disappeared. The CIA has depended on this family to do much of its bidding in the area, but alas, Kurds find themselves in a tough spot where there's almost nowhere else to turn for a voice for an independent Kurdistan. Just a short trip further downriver is the famous Shanidar Cave. This site single-handedly changed how humans understood Neanderthals. In 1957, a team from Columbia University was excavating and found Neanderthal remains. There appeared to be signs of human-like rituals, flowered wreaths, medicines, and evidence of caring for the sick and injured. The Smithsonian houses the remains of Nandi, a 60 to 80 thousand year old Neanderthal. Nandi had recovered in his life from several violent events like a skull crushing blow to his face, losing his right hand and part of his arm either due to disease or trauma, and having leg deformities. We can tell that these injuries all healed over a long period of time, which would suggest that Nandi was still living life, accepted into a group, and being cared after. This is potentially hard evidence that Neanderthals were a much more communal and empathetic group, looking after their sick and elderly. However, in the last 10 years, many are challenging parts of this account. A group of Brits from the University of Cambridge have returned, and with the partnership of local Kurds, they're continuing research. It's speculated the pollen and flowers found underground could have been buried later from rodents called jerds, who were found stashing supplies in the area. No matter how the evolution of our collective consciousness has grown in recent times, this location on Earth is as intimately tied to our understanding of it as it gets. The rest of the daylight was spent heading southeast, through valleys that could have been mistaken for parts of Montana. In a 
rocky prison perched on the mount looked down upon us. Nowadays, it's a Kurdish military post. As the sun started fading, we navigated through small hill country towns to where we were staying for the night. This day was a blur, and it went by so fast. It was full of incredible subject matter new to me that I will continue to research for the rest of my life. <laughs>